Oh, now can you hear me? Oh, yes. yeah. Sorry, sorry. I think the mic was off. Is Nina back? No. Okay. Uh, let's just pray and begin, and hopefully she'll join us back. Um, would anyone like to open us in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for this um, morning that you've given to us for this new day. And, um, and Lord, as we have gathered together to learn more of your word, to learn of the people um, who have um, laid on their lives for the gospel and um, um, who have actually um, uh, brought you glory, Jesus. Lord, I pray that um, we would be inspired Fired, and that we will learn something new and that we will apply in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Nina's back. Sorry, Nina. I think there was, uh, when I started recording, uh, it took you off the call. Okay. So we'll just do a very quick review uh, of what we did last week and then uh, go into. Uh, this week's content. Um, so we just covered a little bit before the Reformation of a few uh, things that happened. So one was uh, there was a preacher in Florence um, and who made a big impact through his preaching on Revelation. Uh, he started uh, to call people back to faith. And um, he also declared that he was a preacher who was chosen by God. And so uh, that was not something that the Pope approved of, and so he was excommunicated and put to death. Um, then there was a, a printer, the printing press that was created, and so for the first time, Bibles could be printed in large numbers, and uh, the Latin Bibles started to be printed in larger numbers. Uh, but still, because Latin was not a language that was known by everyone, uh, the Bibles uh, were mostly available to clergy to um, the priests and church leaders because they were the only ones who could uh, read and speak Latin. Uh, then we see that parts of North and South America were evangelized because of Columbus uh, going out and exploring uh, new parts of the world and uh, taking the Christian faith as he was going to these places. And then we see uh, the beginnings of the Reformation in different parts of uh, Europe, uh, there's Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, uh, England, France, Scotland, uh, all of these different places. There were different groups of people or leaders that God was raising up uh, who started to question some of the things that were happening in the church, who started to uh, call people back to the authority of scripture uh, and um, kind of say that scripture is more uh, has more authority than the Pope and the leaders of the church, uh, which was what was being followed in the church, was that the Pope had ultimate authority. Uh, so they were saying uh, no scripture should have uh, authority above everything that uh, every other person that is in the church. Uh, so these were some of the major things that happened in the Reformation. Um, so after the Reformation was full fledged. Uh, in a lot of parts of Europe, uh, we see that um, there in England there was a new king named James the First who came to power. Uh, and when he came to power, uh, one of the things that happened was there was a meeting of uh, certain uh, people's uh, council of advisors, people from uh, the church. So the English church had split from Rome. Okay, so they had said they no longer wanted to be under the authority of the Pope, and uh, they split off and uh, formed the Church of England, which later came to be the Anglican Church, uh, and they were under the authority of the English King. Uh, so uh, it was actually a political move because the English King didn't want to be under the authority of the Pope. Uh, they had made this split uh, within the Church. And so the English church then had a few leaders who came before the king. And then there was uh, people from the Puritan movement. 
Uh, now, the Puritan movement uh, was called the Puritan movement because it was basically calling people back to a purifying of their faith. Uh, just let me know. I'm just uh, scrolling through here on my presentation. Just tell me if your screen changes, OK? Um, yeah, I think it's fine. OK, so uh, the Puritans were calling people back to uh, a faith that was uh, kind of uh, not following a lot of tradition within the church. So the English church, although it had split from the Catholic church, was still uh, somewhere in between. They were still following a lot of traditions from the Catholic church. Uh, there was still some hierarchy within the church. There were bishops and leaders. And so the Puritans were saying there should not be this kind of hierarchy. That's not from scripture. Uh, we just need uh, church elders. We don't need. Uh, like these bishops to lead the church. Um, and then they were saying there shouldn't be traditions that the church is following. Uh, so they uh, were a different movement that was there. So all of these people came uh, to meet with uh, James the first, to meet with this king, uh, and to uh, address some of the issues within the church, because there was a split within the church. Uh, so through that meeting, one of the things that came up was uh, the need for an English translation that was available to all the people in the church. Uh, so there were many translations of scripture, um, but most of these translations would have side notes on the uh, translation. And some of these side notes would have things supporting their political views. Uh, so one example is the Geneva Bible. And the Geneva Bible, because it came from the Puritan movement, it had questions about the bishops, had questions about the king, uh, should the king have authority over the church. Those kinds of things within the Bible uh, were like added comments by the translators. So obviously, this was not something that the king himself wanted to be in the Bible. Uh, so he agreed for a new translation to be made of scripture. And there were some rules. So one was no additional comments. The only additional comments that could be made was with regard to the Hebrew Greek translation that was uh, being made. And uh, then they were going to go back to the original Greek and Hebrew. They were not going to uh, rely on Latin translations for this text. Uh, so they would translate from Greek and Hebrew into English. Um, and um, they would also use other English translations of the time. So there were several English translations. There was the Tyndale's, there was the Geneva Bible, there was a Great Bible. So lots of different translations that were being used. So they said, we'll use those translations to uh, support the work that we are doing. So in 1607, about 50 translators started working uh, in six groups. They worked in different parts uh, of England and uh, started to translate these scriptures. So it was a large group of people compared to all of the previous translations, which is usually done by one person. Uh, here you had 50 scholars who were working on translating the Bible. Uh, and this is why the King James Version became a very, very popular version, because uh, a lot of work had gone into it, to, to translating it and making it available to all people. So it became the standard Bible for the next 350 years. That was the most popularly used English Bible. Um, and um, it till today is the most um, printed English book ever. So the most copies of any English book that's been printed is the King James Version. Yeah. So uh, what was achieved here was that the Bible was available to everyone, to the common people. And uh, it was available to them in English that for their time was what they were using how they spoke to each other. So uh, that was there. And it was a work of so many people rather than just one translator. So uh, that's why it gained a lot of popularity. And it was an authorized version. So it came from the king himself. He was the one who said, let's go ahead and do this translation. Uh, then we move on to 1646. Uh, John Eliot, um, so he uh, went as a missionary to North America uh, to minister to uh, the Native Americans there. Uh, so he was the first person to publish writing in the native language. So till then, 
uh, they didn't have any written language. Uh, they only spoke it or they used pictures to communicate. Uh, but he put alphabets to the language and then published uh, work in that language and then also allowed um, other work to happen among the Americans. So because that language had been put into a script, they were able to continue work with the Native Americans even after he uh, was no longer there. There was work that would could be continued based on the work that had already started, the written work that had started. So there were several sermons that were translated into the language. And the first uh, Bible printed in their language, which was a Massachusetts language, uh, was printed uh, for them because of John Eliot's work. Um, is this slide changing for you all? No? Oh, sorry. OK. So that's John Eliot, uh, just some of the major things he did. Um, work in the native language, uh, translated sermons, and first complete Bible that was printed in a language from the West. OK, um, there we go into 1649, where uh, a missionary society was formed in New England. Uh, so this was uh, this missionary society was formed specifically to take the gospel to other parts of England. Uh, so a missionary society was basically a sending agency for missionaries, where missionaries uh, would have the support of a sending organization uh, and uh, would be accountable to that organization. So uh, what was important about these societies is that uh, they were encouraging people to go in, into missions. And they were encouraging uh, people to not only go within England. We'll see later on that they also started to send people outside of England. OK, so um, in 1650, uh, we see someone named George Fox. He was uh, born in England. And uh, right from when he was a child, he wanted to know God, and he sought God out. Um, and he started this movement called the Quaker Movement. Uh, why it was called the Quaker Movement was because uh, in their meetings, the Holy Spirit would move so powerfully that they would be physically shaking. So um, to talk about like how they were moving, they started to be called the Quakers. OK, so the, all, all of these names are usually names that are given by outsiders who are observing what's happening inside. Right? It's not they themselves that are giving themselves a name. Um, so uh, some things that would be seen in their meetings were miraculous healings and uh, several other charismatic gifts that were evidenced when they gathered together. Um, they went through a lot of persecution, a lot of um, opposition from the outside uh, because of this uh, manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which was something that had not been seen for so many years and suddenly now is coming into the church. So it uh, was not accepted by the church. And so they had uh, they faced a lot of opposition, but they continued strong in spite of that. Uh, they continued in their faith. They continued to meet and had a great impact um, on uh, different parts of the globe. So right from Turkey to uh, the English colonies. So in North America, the English had moved there and formed colonies. Uh, all of these places were evangelized through the Quakers. So these people went into all of these places with the gospel. So there was already the church there. There was already work happening there. But uh, they went as missionaries to impact all of these places. Uh, by 1656, uh, they had 56 people who were traveling preachers, right? So 1650 is when it started. In six years, they had 56 traveling preachers. Uh, and in 10 years, 40,000 to 60,000 people who were part of their movement, of the Quaker movement. So it was obviously a work of the Holy Spirit. It was not something that was man-made. Uh, we see more missionary societies being formed. So now England became the main place from which a lot of missionaries were being sent out. 
so we saw that first missionary society that was formed. And now uh, one, two were formed in 1698 and 1701. In 1698, to send missionaries to the American colonies, so uh, so in North America, and then in 1701 to send uh, missionaries to the American colonies and the West Indies. Uh, 1726 to 1750 is when the first Great Awakening happened in North America. Uh, so this was along this, so if you can see on the map, um, that east coast of North America, uh, this was where the English colonies were. And uh, so people had been coming from different parts of Europe and settling here, uh, but they had been colonized by England. So England was ruling uh, over all of these places. Uh, but because people had been moving there and had been settling into a new country, there was a lot of hardship for them. Uh, there was no, there were no shops, there were no uh, facilities that were available to them. So there was a lot of like struggle to come into a new place. They had to hunt, they had to gather their own food. Uh, there was a lot of uh, war that was being fought with the Native Americans. Uh, there was a shortage of uh, churches and people to lead the churches. There was no proper guidance that they were receiving spiritually. And so what happened was there was, although they had moved to uh, North America actually for spiritual, for religious freedom. So a lot of the people who moved there were people who were persecuted by the Catholic Church or by the reigning Protestant churches. Uh, they moved to North America for religious freedom uh, because they wanted to be able to practice their faith and they were like true Christians, the Puritans, the Pietists, uh, people who wanted to be able to practice their faith without fear of the church. Uh, but once they came here, because of all of the hardship they were facing, they started to slowly abandon their faith. Uh, they became very lukewarm in their faith. And so in uh, 1726 to 750 is where we see God uh, kind of reviving the church uh, that had started there through two leaders, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield, who were the major uh, uh, people who contributed to what God was doing there. Uh, so Jonathan Edwards, he uh, pastored a church in Northampton, Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is right up here in North America. Um, he was pastoring a church there. And uh, his main concern was that religion had become dead in North America. So people who had gone there with spiritual fervor, with spiritual zeal, had now uh, lost all of that zeal. Um, and so he uh, started uh, to seek God for a revival in North America. And uh, in 1726, Along many of these uh, English colonies, there was a revival that broke out uh, within these places. And uh, during the summer and spring of 1735, Edwards talks about a town in which he preached that was in Northampton, um, that the presence of God filled that town. So every part of the town uh, was impacted by the Spirit of God, and God was powerfully at work there. Uh, he says there's a scarcely a single person in the town, old or young, left unconcerned about the great things of the eternal world. So uh, everyone within that town started to think about the things of God. Uh, it was during this time where God was moving in all of these different places that through Edward's work in Northampton, uh, people within the town, fully within the town, were impacted. Uh, so the presence of God impacted everyone in that city. Uh, his church started to be filled with people who were coming in, seeking God. Uh, people who were already within the church, who had been there for long, started to actually see uh, transformation in their lives, uh, which they had not seen in the years past. Um, and uh, one of Jonathan Edwards' famous sermons is Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So that was uh, when he preached that sermon in 1741. 
Another leader is George Whitefield. Uh, so he um, Yeah, he was a friend of the Wesley. So he is from England, uh, and he was an Anglican clergyman. So the English church was called the Anglican church. Uh, so he was part of the Anglican church, but he was not committed to any specific denomination. Uh, so he traveled throughout these colonies in North America, uh, preaching and teaching. And uh, he was very gifted as a preacher and communicator. So wherever he went, uh, people would put down whatever they were doing. So whatever labor they were in, they would stop their work just to go hear him preach. Uh, because he was there was so much power in his preaching. And they would do outdoor preaching. So they would be out in fields, out in campsites. Uh, so when they came into a place, people would know that they've come in. And immediately, everything in that town would stop because people would go to hear him preach. Um, one example of his preaching is in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, which is the same place uh, where we talked about Jonathan Edwards, Massachusetts. Um, so in Boston, there were 25,000 people who actually lived in that city. But in one of his, uh, the times he was preaching, there were 30,000 people who actually gathered. That means. Either it was the whole city plus some other people who would come in, or more than what the population of that city was. There were so many people who had gathered to hear him preach. Um, as he was preaching, there were uh, powerful moves of the Holy Spirit. So uh, there are records of what how people would be responding as he was preaching. Uh, there would be people crying. There would be people repenting. Uh, and even after he finished preaching, there would be uh, manifestations of the Holy Spirit because of the Holy Spirit moving through the work that he had done through his preaching and through his uh, sermons. Uh, he's said to have preached 3,000 sermons on just on John 3.3, 3, uh, which uh, is Jesus saying, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So uh, through this great awakening, the major preaching was calling people back to God. Uh, so calling people to salvation in Jesus Christ. Um, so that was what George Whitefield was doing. And, um, and that's where huge impact was found, that lots of people were coming to Christ through their preaching. So we'll just uh, stop and do the presentations and then come back. Uh, No, they were separate, two uh, separate leaders in the awakening. Yeah, I think we'll have to do Francis first because yours is the earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Again, good morning. Again, good morning, you. So, according to the roster, I took a million gallery. 
so while I'm preparing, I got a lot of information regarding building area and how the missionary work uh, began in India. And the building area is known as uh, father of modern mission because of his work, what he did in India. He was before, uh, no, he was in the form of like horticulturist, botanist, agriculturist, educator, classical literature, literature translator publisher of first newspaper in the local language, professor of languages, Bible translator, founder of first Serampur University in India. Just one man who dearly loved God and obeyed his word. Pilingari life was like this. Uh, he born, uh, he got married on 1781. Uh, her uh, spouse name is Dorothy Plangan. He had five sons and two daughters. Both daughters died in in fancy and one son died in india his name is peter uh, at the age of five Dor because of that reason uh, dorothy became mentally unstable a uh, lot of uh, thing happened in really care life he can't focus on the missionary work uh, and after that she died on 18 seven after that uh willing Gary married another one person uh, her name is charlotte and his spiritual learning is like this uh, he is uh, doing his studies and after he is reading one book from james cook his voyages uh, he got the more intimacy with the god and he got the passion for the christ um, then after going to he became a pa pastor of baptist church in um, england uh, then he wrote he got the vision from God, uh, he need to go to missionary, not only pastor in the church, uh, all creations, uh, all the people should hear the word of God, or they should uh, listen to who is the true God. And uh, he started studying about a uh, lot of uh, type of people, like a lot of culture, uh, how they're living. He started studying and he prepared a, a publication named An Inquiry into the Obligations of the Heavens. Uh, so uh, through that he tried to tell to other people in baptist uh, ministry this is the what happening we need to go out uh, then on person called john he's from india he's in the instead of that meeting he said okay i'm working in india as a surgeon uh, we are seeking for the peoples are there but they don't know Jesus. but uh william Carey said okay i'm ready for that and his contribution contribution for a church after that is starting that is including in spiritual journey the contribution of church or mis missionary movements first one is bible translation second one is education third is social reforms a fourth one is literature and publishing fifth one is cultural engagement so after uh william Gary came to india first thing happened these uh social reforms because he is studying about the way of uh people living in calcutta there is on uh unusual things happen in before uh in india is uh, sati he start to uh stop the work for that and uh, one of the uh indian uh, political uh, reformer his name is ara roy he also joined with that team so first one is bible translation first one bengali uh the willing came to calcutta but uh, it's not easy a lot of uh financial issues and uh, uh, there is no teamwork, uh, only Willinger is doing everything. He waited for five years to get first person. Like, then became a team from the Baptist church. He sent a person, they sent a person. He reached Calcutta after the five years. So he became very happy. Then became uh, the work started for the publication. Uh, then uh, first he learned Bengali, a lot of people, uh, very good people from uh, that west bengal uh, so they started teaching the bengali language and he is very interested to learn other languages uh, so he second he translated to sanskrit and he translated bible to six other language of north india then education he uh, took a lot of uh, main points of indian education first college uh, in india the main uh, old colleges the third old college is seram university in calcutta still is there uh, is a now theology and uh, literature is teaching there 
So it started around 1880. There is a lot of hard work of William Gary and his team. Uh, it's like uh, there is a, in India, uh, woman education is boycotted. He started the human education in India, and they started constructing. Uh, the person who married a second, uh, Willinger married second person, because of her help, uh, they constructed, and uh, the Dutch government helped him. Social reforms. Uh, before I mentioned uh, that Sadi they boycotted, and female education they started agricultural reforms. Agricultural reforms that they well, they informed, they started new things like uh, lack of water in Calcutta. The irrigation started, and uh, uh, new crops started cultivating. Willinger gave a new mind to the people because of that thing. People are attracted to carry and what he say. Uh, like uh, okay, he is not doing only these things. The main vision of his is share the gospel to other people. The first person is came to Christian uh, from India. Is he's, he's a farmer. Uh, his name is Krishna. Uh, so he's a farmer, and he's because of these things, he said, "Okay, you're a good person." And after that, he shared the gospel. Uh, then the he gave New Testament. The New Testament is happened around after seven years. He came India after seven years. The New Testament translated. The first person who is reading that. Krishna, he received the Jesus Christ. Then literature and publishing uh, is to Dutch government uh, uh, at that time ruling India. So they started to new idea and uh, East India Company is against uh, William Carey, against William Carey because of his mission. The sharing gospel uh, it's like uh, their boy uh, they resist William Carey. After that, he they got no William Carey is translating is good. They started the uh, Colleges and they want William Carey. So William Carey asked, "Okay, wait, what happened? Uh, you are before you are assisting me. Now what you want?" So uh, it's like great uh, thing for India. What William Carey did for the educational, the cultural of India is like fully farming and all. They converted to learn something new and uh, the uh, cultural engagement, language study. Main thing is uh, in Bengali. What happened is. There is a team uh, with other people. Uh, not only William Gary, there is on press team and on uh, learning team, a uh, teaching team. So teaching team, what did these? Uh, they started to uh, in implementing English learning. Not only for men, they, they started to uh, women also. They promoting other Indian language to main level, uh, and they started education and to they reach into local community. Not only the higher caste. People they reach inside of the local, the poor peoples of the society, and a lot of struggles he happened in his missionary journey. Main thing is financial hardship. Uh, he start journey from there more than five months he took for reach at India, uh, very secretly, and uh, so he don't have any money and all. Some people's help him here, but it's not sufficient for him. Uh, he leave a lot of struggles. Uh, he can't go to on hospital for that and that much of uh, financial struggle happened in his life and opposition and criticism from the Indian people and East India Company. They both are resisting building a healthy and isolation he have on fever and uh, it's all through his life uh, is like cause suddenly come and uh, it will go is like as regular is happened on his life because of that issue he died. Uh, and the language and cultural barriers is very struggle to learn another language and loss of man is the main concept of the language first the struggle happened in willinger is sharing gospel the people can't understand uh, the bengali which he is speaking it is slang of english so lack of that and struggles a lot of struggles has happened in india and the military of east india company will resist him a lot of things after he said like this i'm not afraid of Failure. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Francis. Uh, we'll have Sri Radha present me. No. I Yeah, I'm not coming like that. It helps a lot. How are you? Yeah, the group back. Yeah. Okay, now she's sharing. No, she's she went back to that. See, no, 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 Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share the uh, PPT on uh, Charles Grandison thingy. Um, there are some of the introduction. Um, uh, he was born on August 29th, uh, 1792 in Warren, Connecticut, one year after uh, John Wesley's death. It was also just after the War of Independence and the French Revolution where there was a growing anti-christian thought and many people thought christianity would soon be all over there was a rise in unitarianism unitarianism when he was uh, two or three years old they moved to Oneida country upstate new york and uh, shortly then they moved to henderson bay he was a prominent american presbyterian minister and revivalist preacher during the second great awakening a religious revival movement in the early 19th century. His life and work had a profound impact on American Christianity and the broader society. So this is uh, about the background. Um, next thing is his family and upbringing. Uh, so he grew up in a Congregationalist family. His parents were not very religious, though his grandfather had actually been the person that purchased land for Congregationalist first house meetings in Warren, Connecticut. He didn't have a strong religious upbringing. Charles Finney had his, at his early age, didn't receive any religious instructions, but he was a very bright person. And something about his family that um, he married three times. In 1824, he married Lydia Ruth Andrews uh, while, while he lived in Jefferson country. They had six children together 
In 1848, a year after Lydia's death, he married Elizabeth Ford Atkinson in Ohio. In 1865, he married Rebecca Allen Rell, also in Ohio. Each of Finney's three wives accompanied him on his revival tours and uh, joined him in his evangelistic efforts. Finney's great grand grandson, also named Charles Anderson Finney, became a famous author. Um, about his early life, about his studies and career, in his early years, somewhere along this time period, his uh, brother, uh, his, uh, his younger brother, is drawn to a revival meeting and his brother would receive the Lord that time. And uh, this is just an assumption that his brother really played a part as he started to feed into Charles Finney. And Charles Finney became many ways disturbed. There was uh, something going on the inside of him. And in 1812, in 1812, in Henderson, he would take up and become the teacher at the little schoolhouse. But in 1812, he decided he wanted to become his education. Uh, he wanted to continue his education. And he went back to Warren, Connecticut to continue high school and began university classes. But he faced some challenges uh, or opposition inside the college. At that time, he saw profanity and it really broke him. Uh, from his inside and he felt the disturbance again uh, this all were very beginning to disturb and get his attention uh, through uh, to his ministry shortly afterwards his mother got ill and uh, so he went back to them uh, in henderson bay then he found a job working in adams a small village he started working in a law office of his church of this uh, church and here he begins to train to become a lawyer this became a critical time because in learning about the law, he understood that they would apply a loop at the word and use the word. And it really began to drive him towards the word of God. He joined the local Presbyterian church that time and he actually became the head of the choir. In 1835, Charles Finney became the professor and uh, later the president of Oberlin College in Ohio. Under his leadership, over, uh, just, um, so over, uh, under his leadership, Oberlin be, uh, became one of the first American colleges to admit women and African Americans. Um, okay. So Charles Finney's revival methods and theological te uh, technique uh, teachings left a lasting mark on American evangelical evangelicalism. He is remembered as a dynamic preacher who played a key role in the religious and uh, social landscape of 19th century in America. Uh, some of the things revival preaching, Finney's uh, revival meetings often featured uh, emotionally charged sermon and uh, anxious benches where people could cry, uh, pray for salvation. And one of the thing is the public invitation or altar call where he issued an explicit, explicit invitation to come forward for salvation. He emphasized individual conversion and asked people to repent and uh, turn to God. And uh, some of his contribution in churches, uh, first thing is the people in Northern Ireland, James McQuillan uh, and company used what he said to pray and uh, help to birth the great happening in 1859. And over 1 million people came to the Lord through this revival. And uh, second is even Roberts who birthed Welsh um, revival was also influenced by Charles Finney and some churches influenced by his prayers. He said, if the church does not have a burden for souls, it is black sliding. Black -sliding. Uh, and so it starts with us, but a revival must always end with people coming to the knowledge of Jesus. His, his contribution behind churches was a lot. His prayers helped the churches to stand and pray for the revivals. He wrote many books regarding prayers and revivals. One of the book is Lectures on Revivals. And um, apart from this, his role in social uh, reform, beyond social matters, 
Finney was also involved in various social reform movements, including abolitionism. And second is he believed that Christianity should lead to social justice and actively advocated for the abolition of slavery and women's rights. Thank you, Sri Dada. So we will close you today and we will continue uh, tomorrow when we start. Thank, Thank you. you.